let's get started. I'm going to introduce you to our first presenters. These two women will truly enlighten you. The first presenter, Gillian Carrara. She is the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago Fashion Resource Center director, as well as a lecturer, as well as, well as very famous Chicagoan. I mean, I think everybody has a Chicago crush on her, to be perfectly honest. In addition, um, Jude Stewart will be up here with her as well. Um, she's a journalist, uh, graphic designer, and she also writes a lot about visual culture, too. Her most recent book is Patternalia. Do you know what Patternalia is? It's about patterns, everybody, an unconventional history of polka dots, stripes, plaid, camouflage, and other graphic patterns. And listen, they're going to be talking about maximalism, did I say that right this time, versus minimalism. So the age-old question of is less is more or more is more or less is a bore? We'll let them let us know. Okay, come on up, ladies. Thank you, G. Oh. Very, very nice introduction. It's lovely to be here in this room. I just love it. So relax. I'm the academic in the group. So what I'd like to begin with is with my definition and thoughts on minimalism in fashion, you will see images of returning garments as examples from the wardrobe of the School of the Art Institute's Fashion Resource Center. The collection is a hands-on, non-circulating compilation of contemporary and avant-garde designer fashions available for examination by the SAIC community. Guests from the public are quite welcome to communicate with me directly via email. And I'm always delighted to understand why guests would like to come into the Resource Center, and I'm very available to you by appointment. So let me begin. Minimalism in fashion motivates modernity. Minimalism begins as a designer's process of elimination, initially within an intellectual concept, then the garment's aesthetic and technical development. Minimal fabric weight, minimal construction, minimal details in the surface, minimal effort to movement when the wearer is in motion. According to one journalist, minimalism in fashion and architecture is the most popular design approach of our time. This approach to design requires a great deal of competence to create an impressive result. Minimalism has its roots in the early part of the 20th century when women's clothes became reduced in all elements of dress. Dress was finally practical after centuries of wearing complex constructions. Minimalism reached its academic high point between 1960 and 1968. You will see my examples on the screen. In one orange dress, linear, it's by André Courage. Dresses in the 1960s were reductive in their A-line frame. Inventive materials, angular seaming, top stitching, and always squared off. In the Dictionary of the Arts, the definition states that minimalism developed in the 1950s in reaction to abstract expressionism, then avoiding its emotive approach in favor of elemental modular shapes. Many designers equate reduction and abstraction with beauty and progress. Minimalism is an enduring aesthetic 
that has shaped modern fashion. From intellectual designers, as you see in these dissolving images, like Rei Kawakubo of Comte de Garçon, Yoji Yamamoto or Gareth Pugh, also I include the designers Giorgio Armani and Jill Sander, specialized in their theories I believe that their fashions are between functional and aesthetic. Minimalism as a movement in sculpture is severely simplified in composition and allows me to identify a machine pleated and flattened Ise Miyake garment off the body. It adapts to the principles of minimal art as a sculpted garment when worn on this body. Minimalism is a goal shared by art and design. They both encompass subtractive strategies. Minimalism revitalizes its ideals in the garments that you've been viewing and those to come. Here you are viewing what has been thoroughly worked out. Basic shapes, simplified design, and ultimately collective progress. Thank you, but I'd like to add this. There is a very important designer who works in LA, but he designs for the label Moschino in Milan. His name is Jeremy Scott, and he feels that minimalism is boring. <laughs> Although he, in his collections, attracts a completely different crowd than those who would wear minimalism. He is about pattern, amusement, print, topic, but what you've been seeing on the screen, in my opinion, are the best of the minimalism that students, faculty, and guests study in the Fashion Research Center. Again, I thank you. Enjoy the afternoon. Gillian, you're not boring. Come on, you make minimalism so unboring. <laughs> now I'm worried. I'm Jude Stewart, and I'm the author of a book called Patternalia with a wraparound title, The Unconventional History of Many Different Patterns. And I've done this multiple times, and I still can't always say my own subtitle. But it is basically the cultural history of, uh, that's kind of buried in patterns like polka dots and camouflage and stripes. And so, without further ado, I will be go right here into our presenter mode. All right, so we're doing a defense of maximalism today. So, what is maximalism? I went to the OED and was surprised to discover some definitions of maximalism that we won't be discussing today, but are nonetheless telltale and somewhat illuminating. For instance, we won't concern ourselves with the extreme left faction of the Russian Social Revolutionary Party, which in the early 20th, 20th century um, advocated terrorism against the czars. We will not be doing that. Next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> how can you not have some fun? We also won't talk about how maximalism's meaning drifted to, to cover any extreme political group. Or, quote, a person who holds out for the maximum in his or her demands and is not prepared to compromise. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Unless you want to stay, you know, whatever you like. Um, forget it. Forget you even saw that. Um, we're only here to discuss maximalism as a style choice, but already you can see how its other meanings give the word a hectoring, belligerent, and gobbling quality. Next slide, please. I asked to defend maximalism today because it seemed more challenging as a position. But why exactly? The pickle this question put me in starts with making this slideshow. An all maximalist slideshow is almost impossible to unify visually. I had to allow a certain intriguing ugliness to reign supreme. 
There's a whole uh, website that has like the most ugly Hawaiian shirts. That is completely a thing. It's, it, it was amazing. All right, next slide. All right. Let's air some complaints again against maximalism before defending its virtues. Maximalism lets it all hang out. It doesn't seem very self-aware. It demands that you clear space for it and then, fabulously or horribly, fills that space to the brim. Next slide, please. Its ideas aren't always good enough to justify that level of pushiness. And this is from the fall 2015 collection of Memphis Design Movement. Like it or not, it's back. Next slide, please. It's not accidental that maximalist styles, rich in color, pattern, or other details, get relegated to the other. Next slide. Artist David Batchelor wrote an entire book called Chromophobia about the West's entrenched fear of color as queer, hysterical, childish, savage, and ridiculous. That argument casts minimalism in a surprising role as the dominant paradigm. It's thoughtlessly universal. It's more akin to the sphere of white, straight, rich men than we might have supposed. My second difficulty with this presentation is personal. I'm a design and cultural writer and author of two books, Illustrated Histories of Color and Pattern, respectively, but both are very minimalist in visual style. So I'm outed. At the same time, I realize my approach to writing actually bends towards maximalism. Both my books take a wide-angle, cross-disciplinary approach to exploring, exploring all the things that a simple pattern or color can mean across different cultures and contexts. They're maximalist, trawling the ocean kind of projects. And this is from the opening of uh, the pink chapter of my book, Roji Biv, and you can see all the different themes are sort of messily unified, and all of this is contained in the book. Why love maximalism, then? Let us count some ways. Today, it's an underdog stylistic choice. And yes, this is a pattern of pigs in a blanket from my book, Paternalia. As such, maximalism is gutsy. Minimalism used to be gutsy until it became ubiquitous and safe and emptied of statement. Present company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> Minimalism has become a highly defensible hedge against bad taste. Now it's often tainted with a herd-like quality. Maximalism is unapologetic. It's the dominion of weirdos. Even as a category, it's miscellaneous. To apply Tolstoy's dictum about happy and unhappy families uh, to high school, the minimalist popular kids are all alike, but every maximalist is strange in particular in his own way. And this is um, Nick Cave, and I have to thank Gillian for this because she uh, introduced me to her colleague's work, and it, he is fantastic, these sound suits. Next slide, please. Oh, I think we lost some slides. Keep going, please. So I talked through that. Next one, great. Thank you so much for reminding me. These are Nick Cave sound suits, and he does these incredible displays with music, and they dance, and they're, as you can see, completely in motion. Now we'll go to the next slide. And those are some more of his uh, sound suits. <laughs> Another awesome thing about maximalism, it's irreducible. It refuses to be slimmed down. It resists the virtual sphere and loves the haptic. This partly explains why the modern eye is still so drawn to minimalism. We're more oversaturated than ever. We crave images that restore order and slow time down. Next slide. Minimalism can still be strong, handsome, and intelligent. But it can, too often, it can become paternalistic. It can make too many decisions for us. This is Lady Gaga wearing Alexander McQueen. Two maximalists right there. Next slide, please. Like eating only snack food, we should be more suspicious of how smoothly minimalism slides down the gullet how easily it's digested, and how hungry it may actually leave us. This, these uh, dresses, by the way, have live and silk flowers in them, on the one on the right, so it has smell as well. Next slide, please. Uh, give maximalism some love. If you stick with it for just a few minutes, an exciting sense of order can emerge. Ugliness is transformed. Shouting becomes ululation, or giggles, or both. You'll be returned to your body. It's mind-clearing, exhilarating, and spine-tingling all at once. Thank you. <laughs> well, that was uh, very enlightening. I was kind of expecting maybe some sort of like, uh, you know, actual fist fight to ensue. No, I'm oh, kidding, well. just kidding. Um, 
Okay, so quick question for you though. Um, in what ways are your personalities reflective of what you're advocating for? Um, Gillian, I, I think you've said before that you enjoy solo work. Is that something typical of someone who enjoys minimalism? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Like you enjoy solo work. Like you enjoy working kind of sometimes on your own, on your, on your and is that something that's reflective of, of a minimalist, someone who loves minimalism? I'm not sure about that, but it's true that I do work alone in my studio as a metalsmith, and I'm very happy to work quietly on individual pieces of jewelry. But then when I go to my home office, it's the same with my lecture preparation. Everything is in order, all my books, the light, the glass, the wood, the stainless steel. I think it all goes together. And when I walk into my bedroom, I have a wardrobe where I open, the light goes on so that I can see all the black garments <laughs> facing <laughs> left to right. Awesome. See, a lot of order. A lot of order is in your life. There is a lot of order in my life and I find beauty in it and pleasure mm -hmm. and satisfaction. And Jude, does this mean that you have a very messy, disorganized home? Because you are all about maximalism. I have maximalism. a toddler, so yes. <laughs> is, it like, is it like anthropology exploded in your house? Like colors everywhere? A little bit, yeah. I do have a lot of color in my house. But, you know, it's funny. These things are minimalism and maximalism. They sort of, they're the circle that they end up touching each other. Like as I was looking at your, your pieces, I'm noticing all the beautiful details and the point of removing all these other things is to let other things come to the foreground, you know, so it's about choices. And everything I said, I mean, I do actually love minimalism, but I love it when it makes a real statement. And it is about subtracting the right things and bringing out the wrong, or the other things, you know, and, and maximalism, like why it's, you know, can be hateable is because it doesn't uh, make choices. So Wait, but you didn't answer. So is I your closet no. like, is your closet like Gillian's? Do you see all the black and the? <laughs> no, I have actually no black. I have a lot of, like, almost no black at all, but I do have a lot of gray because I wear a lot of color. So um, gray and color really pop well together. But in my work style, I would say, um, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of creating a huge mess and then pruning it back and cleaning it up, and then I enjoy the process, and it has to be the mess is part of it. It's like a binge purge kind of thing. Very so. nice. <laughs> Any questions out here? We have, I think we have a few minutes. Don't be shy. You weren't shy earlier when I asked if you had style. Anything at all. Anyone? Ooh, a voice from the darkness. Now we see, okay, we see you, yes. Um, I had a question as you were doing your little debate, and the first thought that came to mind was coexist. Can you, can you have maximalism and minimalism coexisting? I believe you can. What do you guys think? Personal, personally, no. <laughs> <laughs> but personally, no. No, I'm not going to wear a necklace and a scarf and long earrings and spiked heels. No, personally, no. I wear black. <laughs> this, the reason I wore this, it's a almost, it's a near vintage isemiake that was created enormously and then pleated to the shape that I'm wearing today. Um, so I wanted to wear this to make a, a point. But no, I wear black because um, it identifies me, but identifies me with uh, pleasure. It fits me and it identifies me. And I think since I was in college, I've never worn anything but black. Yeah. So, and people say, ah, I know who you are, the one with the round glasses and the black dress. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's important to me that I wear black. I think I think it can, and maybe my brand of maximalism is is that you know. So like, I'm picture my living room here, and I have a I have a pale blue couch. I have a pink and orange, like hot pink and orange rug. I have another rug that's pink, but you know that the lines are really clean, and um, and the textures are important, and so it's this like a lot of color, and at the same time, it's uh, it's very pulled back in other respects, and I think it's that choice of 
you know, if you're going to wear skinny pants, you can wear a big coat, but you can't wear big coat and big pants. You know, you have to make some contrasts and some choices. And so, um, yeah, I think so. I think that that's how I'm practicing it, I hope. So just to be clear, Jude said yes, but Gillian said no. Okay, everybody, <laughs> just to make that clear. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes, sir. I think the question is, does any of this apply to men? Absolutely. Did I say that? Absolutely. I can um, say for sure that walking into a symposium or walking into an event, women identify each other by their black dresses. If a man has a great fit to his black suit and he's wearing a black t-shirt or a black uh, shirt, He's an architect or he's a designer and he could be really interesting. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, there is maxim, maximum choices for men that I know and uh, that are academics as well. Um, but I would say that uh, these are choices by either men or women mm -hmm. on whether they feel comfortable and expressive in one choice or the other. Totally. I, I mean, the canvas of men's clothing is more defined. So you have, you know, you have a tie as part of the uniform. The socks are part of the uniform. And I love to see people doing exciting and unexpected things in those little spaces. It's just like the contained maximalist sock thing. I'm so into that. I really think that's cool. But you can't do that as your whole outfit because you look like a clown, you know? <laughs> so I think that maybe men are a little more constrained that way. But that means that it's con you can think of it as constrained or you can also think concentrated, you know, that it's really a small canvas where you have to do something amazing. So go buy amazing socks. That's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you, thank you. sharing thank you. your thank thoughts you. with thank us. You. Thank you to Gillian Carrara and also Jude Stewart. And Jude has a book. And I believe, Jude, you'll be, you're selling the book and you'll be signing copies of the book and people can come and meet you. Unfortunately, Gillian has, is very, very busy, right? So you've got to probably get going. So. Yes, she's very needed by because her students. I'm in the middle of a class and an installation. Yes, she has a huge but installation enjoyed your tomorrow. Company this afternoon. Thank you so much, Gillian. Thank you so much, Jude. So I just want to start this by asking. You know, I don't think most people think about style in writing. Um, can, so I'm going to let you take it away. Um, is this on? Yes. Can you? Okay. Can everybody yeah, well, hear Jenny? I think I'd like it's it's a it's a tough act to follow fashion people who have beautiful pictures. Um, I think it's going to be harder for us to. Is it not is it on? It? There. There I'm you sorry. go. I think it's going to be harder well, for us to strike a dramatic contrast. Although I think I'm all I know is a lot of people were interested in the serial comma. Yeah. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think when it comes to style and writing, I think what most people probably think about when they hear that is sort of literary, literary style in the grand sense. You know, what makes Marcel Proust sound different from Zadie Smith sound different from, you know, James Patterson sound different from whoever. And that's a huge topic, um, a very complicated topic, but I think what we're talking about is this sort of other layer of style or concept of style that sort of exists, I'm not sure if it's underneath it or just on top of it. And um, I am a reporter at the New York Times. I have in my past lives been also an editor, including a copy editor at the New York Review of Books, the Boston Globe, New York Times Book Review. So I've sort of been on both sides of this. But if you work at a publication, one thing that you um, inevitably have encounters with is the style book, which you could also possibly call the dreaded style book. <laughs> and it's sort of rules for your publication. And this is the New York Times style book, which I have to confess, I had to kind of dig this up off my desk because now that it's now that I'm a reporter, I try to just kind of do what I'm doing and, until somebody tells me I'm not allowed to, which happens um, on a fairly regular basis. But uh, so I, I felt a little bit intimidated at being on the stage with Carol, being someone who's written a really wonderful book about copy editing, is someone who's thought very deeply about this, really knows what she's talking about. Uh, I will point out I got 80% correct on the online How Well Do You Know the Chicago Man Manual Style Test. Um, <laughs> But I feel a little, if I, I, my immediate reaction is if I'm going to be called up here to defend the New York Times style book, I'm, in, I'm slightly miscast. Because if you're a reporter, you're in a kind of constant, low-grade state of warfare against, if not the style book, the copy editor's 
bless their hearts, as they say in the South, um, who are enforcing the style book. <laughs> so when I actually read this, I was startled to realize that it's actually quite sensible. I was reading the brief introduction, elegantly written and sensible. So I just want to read a passage that I think will explain a little bit more about what we mean by style. Um, if that first kind of style is a form of painting, he's referring to kind of literary style, the second kind, style book style, is framing and canvas. Its, its structure of spelling, grammar, and punctuation supports and protects the writer's craft. The rules avert missteps that could keep the reporter from holding the exacting reader. As the previous edition of this book noted, there is little difference between a martini with a capital letter and a martini with a, a lowercase letter, but a rule can shield against untidiness in detail that might make readers doubt large facts. So I think the, the, the sort of bottom line is inconsistencies, grammar errors, dubious choices can annoy readers, especially readers of a certain sort, and you tend to hear from them. And all it does is kind of detract from what you're trying to say by making people angry because you've used a serial comma, split your infinitive, committed some sort of outrageous act of rogue capitalization, or I don't know what. Anyway, wow. that's my little summary of style. So. <laughs> Okay, well, um, Jenny and I thought we would present just a few slides um, to show some examples of New York Times and Chicago style. But first I want to say I did not bring my Chicago Manual of Style because it's just too big and heavy to carry <laughs> through the rain. A thousand pages on capitalization, punctuation, hyphenation, and um, citation, which uh, since Chicago was created mainly for scholars 110 years ago, um, rather than newspapers, uh, it, it has a slightly different, it has a very different purpose and cast from uh, the New York Times style or the Associated Press AP style, which is also used by a lot of newspapers. Um, so, um, before we get to the slides, that was one of the points we wanted to make sure was understood that uh, there are different style guides because there are different kinds of writing. And just as um, you would wear different kinds of clothing for different occasions, um, you would choose a different kind of style maybe depending on your audience. So anyway, to be polite, I thought I'd first tell um, some things I like about New York Times style. <laughs> So the big one is that you guys get to leave the hyphen out of the word email. I mean, when I think of all the hyphens I have to type every time I type that word, it's just really annoying and useless. So good for you. <laughs> and the New York Times style guide offers advice on obscenity, vulgarity, and profanity, which is really spicy. We don't have anything like that. <laughs> And professors kind of get to say whatever they want when they write, so that's another fun thing about your style. So next, I'll tell you something I don't like about Chicago style. When you make um, a possessive, a lot of, um, there are different um, methods for doing this, and um, just as you would, um, if you're making the possessive of a plural, you would add an apostrophe, but no S, um, a lot of people also would drop that S from singulars that have an S already on the end. But we don't. We add that apostrophe S no matter what. And this is the result. How do you even pronounce those things? <laughs> I don't know. I would say no thank you to that one. So next, there are some things about New York Times style that are just a little fussy. Uh -huh. I couldn't believe this, frankly. <laughs> You're not allowed to say that the White House tweets or retweets. I guess they think that's um, disrespectful. You have to say it posts a tweet or, or sh instead of retweet, reshares on Twitter. I think there's some slippage on an everyday <laughs> level on that. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. And uh, finally, something I like about Chicago style is that we do use the serial comma before the and, which prevents sentences like, 
the queen was invited along with her sons, Elton John and Donald Trump. <laughs> so that's my part of the debate. You can respond. Okay. Uh, for the record, I'm totally with you on tweeting, retweeting, and it's, I, I think I'm now having some vague sort of post-traumatic memory of having, being forced to refer to someone writing in a Twitter post versus just tweeting, but I think there's, I think that stuff is kind of moving a little bit more. Um, also, as another matter of triumph, I was allowed a couple weeks ago, um, there was the big 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare, and I wrote a bunch of stuff about this, and I was allowed once to refer to him as the bard, which is frowned on as being kind of corny. And I thought it was okay since it, w it was sort of alluding to the sort of slightly corny elevation of him as the bard. So sometimes you win these, these very small victories and they kind of keep you going. Anyway, uh, so you ended on your little bio. Here's my little uh, Twitter bio, which I wanted to put up because I, I mentioned the Oxford comma, which is another name for the serial comma. This is when I was writing this whimsical Twitter bio three years ago, in addition to wearing a really strange hat, um, which I now I'm realizing is, is maximalist and possibly even uh, fashionable. And I will add, I bought it at a sample sale of an actually very hip designer, but there may have been a reason it was in the like $5 bin. But anyway, um, I am an authentic defender of the Oxford comma, also known as a serial comma, but Carol just talked about from way back. I was thrilled to learn what I did not know in your one of your books that it is sometimes also known as um, the Harvard comma, and these refer to university presses. Uh, so it has many, many different names, and you'll notice I actually use it there, the actual comma. Um, and it was a great day when I, the, a Twitter account called Oxford comma started following me. But anyway, so keep sticking to uh, Carol's um, format. So. I, I went for black, kind of minimalist background on my slides. So two things I liked about Chicago style. Um, the serial comma, first of all, and this is what the, uh, Chicago strongly recommends this widely used usage, blessed by Fowler. Don't even get me started on Fowler. Another style guide, which is truly excellent and awesome, and other authorities since it prevents ambiguity. And um, what our style book says is it generally discourages it except where you want to prevent ambiguity. So I will say in defense of time style that in that sentence about Donald Trump and whoever, we would have added the comma because, you know, the, the point ultimately is just making sense. And your rules can always be bent, broken, thrown aside when in service of what you're actually trying to say. And nobody wants to look ridiculous. Um, although sometimes in our office at the copy desk it seems like it. Um, and also, there, it seems like there's a little bit more wiggle room in Chicago for um, switching between like and as. And this, this is something that comes up, I think, because uh, well, what Chicago says is consider context and tone when deciding whether to impose standard English. And I think that's something that um, is relevant to the kinds of articles I write or things in the paper. Because sometimes you're writing a kind of much more formal news report. Sometimes you're writing something that's a little bit more voicey or casual or and it's just going to sound really stilted and wrong to enforce some kind of correctness or hyper-correctness. Um, okay, New York Times style, what's not to like? There's this rule against this thing called indirection. I know there's at least one person in the audience here, a former New York Times copy editor, who knows exactly what this means. Does anybody else know what this is? So anyway, this is a little write-up in the Times style book. Indirection is what Harold Ross of the New Yorker called the quirk of sidling into facts as if as the reader already knew them. I may have left out an if there. Oh, no. So it's basically kind of bringing up, like writing a sentence like, you know, she watched as her redheaded five-year-old, you know, ran across the room. And in the New Yorker, they would probably write that sentence as she watched as her son, who was five, year, five years old and had red hair, ran across the room. So you can't like sort of write your sentences assuming that you have to sort of introduce the, f the facts in a more clear way. But the thing is on the copy desk, you'll often get these queries from the copy editors saying, I think this might be indirection. Because nobody is quite, we can't all agree on what it is. And the other thing to remember about um, copy editors, especially at a, a newspaper like the Times, is they have bosses and they're sort of getting evaluated based on how 
well they're enforcing the style book. So they kind of have a slightly different relationship with this whole process than the writer. So I don't want to be too harsh on them. But anyway, there's often these very philosophical conversations about whether something is in direction or not. Um, and I don't think Chicago has anything to say about this, to its great credit. Um, I, I was asked to come up with examples of things from New York Times style that are silly, which I really hesitate to do in public because I would like to remain employed. <laughs> um, but one of my things that I just always find like slightly irritating is there are some prohibitions against or you know sort of strong discouragements of certain words. It to me just seem like very common, very useful words. They aren't overly slangy or jargony or embarrassing or they stopped being so 10 years ago. And one of them is launch. So you can't launch a campaign or a product. You can only launch rockets basically. And I, I don't know, I've never written an article about a rocket being launched, but you know, there's times when I want to use this word. And then there's this sort of issue of split infinitives. Does that mean anything to people in this room? Oh, wow. So raise your hands if you, that means anything to you. Okay. So basically, there's this idea, which I believe dates back to the 19th century in some, you know, grammarian who had drunk too much coffee or something, introduced this rule that if you have an infinitive verb like to, to go, you can't put an adverb between it. So the famous violation of this rule is Star Trek, to boldly go. And in the New York Times, you are not supposed to split infinitives. And here's the, the, what the style manual actually says. Split infinitives are accepted by grammarians, meaning modern day grammarians think it's okay to do it, but irritate many readers. <laughs> when a graceful alternative exists, avoid the construction. And my reaction to this is, these are the kinds of readers we should be irritating, or if they're irritated by this, <laughs> that's their problem, you know. Um, but I, I think another thing to keep in mind is that we actually, I don't so much personally, but the paper does, like we have very attentive, um, you know, very intelligent, uh, very invested, uh, sometimes very uh, persnickety readers, and you hear from them, and they can get really outraged about some stuff, and you just, there is this feeling that we're answerable to them, which I suppose is admirable, but I still feel like, what is the problem with splitting infinitive? Just write what sounds graceful and natural, and, Chill, because uh, you know your meaning will be clear. Um, so New York Times, something about the New York Times style that's clearly superior. I'm basically just kind of echoing what um, Carol said that we do offer advice about obscenity, taste, what belongs in a quote unquote family newspaper. I could tell you some great stories, but they wouldn't be appropriate to a family humanities festival, um, especially when my mother is in the audience. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like we all kind of at the paper. I think when issues come up and you're quoting somebody or a a sort of obscene or a word or a sort of crude sexual term is used by a public figure or in the title of a song and like everybody knows what it is, everybody's talking about it, everybody knows, everybody does these things all the time. Um, we can't use it and it can be really frustrating and sometimes we come up with these ways of writing around it that just seem like ridiculous except at the end of the day I do think it's worth not just being too casual with this stuff and um, like for example when I, when I read The New Yorker which they now use the F word fairly frequently, and I always find it just kind of really shocking, and maybe it's just something about seeing that word in their typeface that just seems like totally wrong <laughs> as an aesthetic thing. So anyway, I appreciate, as much as I bridle against it, I appreciate this sort of idea of kind of standards and taste, and that it's something that's worth thinking about and worth uh, sort of considering where you draw the line, rather than just saying, I won't say F it, you know, do whatever you want. So. Anyway, I think that's my last slide. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, Carol, oh Jenny, we can't follow fashion people. That was absolutely fascinating, that was awesome. I know you guys have questions. And so funny, you're both so funny. <laughs> questions? And I also really appreciated the bitmoji you had at the bottom of your screens, Carol. Uh, just this morning, I saw something about the Yahoo Book of Style. And I wonder if you have seen that or if you have any commentary on it. The, the Yahoo Book of Style? Yes, the, yes that was a, um, that's been out for a few years. And it was a really important um, breakthrough in the little world of style guides because an, um, up until Yahoo came out with their style guide, there wasn't anything for people uh, 
specifically focusing on online issues, which are different from print issues. And um, uh, the New York Times and Chicago, our manuals um, really are based in the print culture. And um, things like, um, just one example, in print, we're used to um, indenting a paragraph mm -hmm. and not having any space between paragraphs. If you look at printed books, that's the norm. But online, that's a difficult way to read. And so the, um, the convention has arose very quickly of not indenting paragraphs and putting a space in between them. And that's become, I don't know whether that's in the Yahoo style guide or not, um, but that's the kind of thing that, that uh, conventional style guides weren't helping with. So um, it's a highly respected guide and we recommend it. I think it's probably even in the bibliography of the Chicago Manual of Style. Yeah, I would say when I had grabbed this book off my shelf and one of the reasons I was for reading, I'm like, I don't know if this is the most up to date because some of the en entries for terms like internet or World Wide Web, it just seemed like this just isn't, you know, sounds weird, and I noticed it was 1999. Um, I don't know if any of you caught this, but a couple of weeks ago there was a big kind of to-do because I think it was AP announced they were gonna stop uppercasing internet. Yeah. So there's a lot of chatter yes. about that. I was um, there. <laughs> and I don't know what their <laughs> thinking was, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, over Another here question? on the left. Um, as a copy editor for like a high school newspaper, I often wonder how much the changes I'm making to um, an article that may not be received as a wide audience is going to be noticed. And so as first a copy editor and then a, a reporter, how much do you feel that uh, as, a re as a reporter then writing an article that the copy edits limit what you're trying to say, um, and then when you receive, I'm not sure how the process works, but when you receive an article back and look at the edits, how much you notice them and how much maybe uh, your writing has been changed? Um, I would say, so you're a, high, you're a high school journalist now? Okay, great, which, which high school? Oh, great, okay, I'm a veteran of the new chair news, so. Um, and I was even like having this vivid memory of a argument that I was not party to between the copy editor of the my high school newspaper and another reporter about a personal pronoun in a headline. Like, it's also fresh to me. But um, these things can be very emotionally fraught. Um, but I think, well, first of all, you notice it because you, the files you get back have, like, track change. You see it visually. But, I mean, I think I'm, the, I'm kind of uh, obsessive about details, and I think I'm a... I think I'm a strong, like, instinctual writer, and, like, I kind of have my rhythms, and I just, like, it's really obvious to me when things have been changed, even, like, commas move, because I just have my own feelings about this stuff, which, you know, aren't necessarily always correct, but, um, but I think the thing is, as much as, and this is true for sort of editing more generally, not just copy editing, even though it can be very fraught, and on the one hand, you feel like, oh, my gosh, don't touch my, don't touch my copy, don't change anything, and the other hand, you're like, help me, help me, make it better. I really want you to pay attention and work on this and like give me love and help. It's, they really are there to help you. Um, and they, I mean, good copy editors are just invaluable. I think it was one of the papers in San Francisco announced this past week they're gonna stop copy editing or stop copy editing stuff that runs on the inside of the paper. And just like if stuff we wrote was not copy edited, it, it would be terrible. So you're, you are, you're doing something really important. Um, and yeah, anything journalism is just a very collaborative process in that way, so don't worry. <laughs> well, first of all, you need to read my book. <laughs> you do, you do. <laughs> because it's all about, um, it's not about how to copy edit, it's how to work with writers, or if you are a writer, how to work with a copy editor. And it's about getting the ego out of it and putting the reader first in the negotiation, in the conversation. And um, once you're able to do that, anytime you are copy edited, um, you'll see that if, if the copy editor misunderstood you, it's likely that a reader might also misunderstand you. So even if you don't fix it the way the copy editor suggested, you should take seriously the idea that it needed fixing. Um, and. Uh, and yeah. yeah, and good luck to you. That's, it's great that you're doing that. We have time for one more question. Who's gonna be the lucky recipient of the last question? It looks like the lady in the blue sweater. 
Hi there, guys. Um, as a journalist who first worked for a um, magazine that used Chicago style and now works for an AP institution, I totally can feel that it can be very tricky and you have a lot of allegiances to one particular style. But my main question pertains to, um, to the world of online work. And I've noticed with some um, web-only news outlets like Fusion and Quartz and you know, publications that have very renowned journalists working for them and I believe have big investments behind them, the comma splices are just all over the place. And they just, and so that kind of is a question, I guess, do they not employ copy editors or are comma splices so common these days? I mean, I always read it and I'm like, put a semicolon or put a period, just do it. Like, and I'm shocked that these stories, <laughs> and they just do it. And it, is it just because it's conversational or people don't know anymore that it's incorrect because the idea of being so careful about grammar isn't cool anymore? I just am fascinated by the change, and I'm kind of curious what you guys have seen or how you view it. Yeah. If you see me afterward, I can give you some links to articles about comma splices. Um, they're not what they used to be, and although I really don't like them, they are, yes, increasingly accepted, and especially in fiction, um, they're f sometimes even favored. It's a mm. thing now. Um, and yeah, I think that it's true that, um, that many, many online resources are not copy edited. Yeah. And I mean, I would say in response to that too, and also speaking to your kind of visceral response to just like, ugh, when you see that. Um, Cause you know, I have that about certain things, but I'm also just, uh, I'm not sure like comma splices per se bother me, but there are other things that do. But I think some of this stuff just comes down to taste and preference and aesthetics. And I, I, there's two quotes I wanted to read brief. One is from one of the books that Carol has done that I think is coming out soon, the Q and A. From the, so the Chicago has this style blog and people send in questions and some of them are posted online. And do you write all the answers? Or? It's, it's a team effort. Yeah. And they're very funny and tart. And it, well, I think the thing about a lot of these style books is they're quite witty in their own sometimes very subtle way. But I loved this question somebody wrote. Dear CMOS, Chicago Manual Style, I am a nearly, I'm nearly done revising my dissertation, but my advisor may not pass me on account of my lengthy M dashes. M dashes are just like long dashes. And so you just read that, you're like, what could that possibly be about? Who cares? But I think uh, clearly this person, this professor, has some kind of visceral aesthetic. And then speaking of witty style guides, I referred in one of my or Chicago quoted Fowler, who is this British style guru from the sort of early part of the 20th century, wrote this wonderful Fowler's Guide that was revised by another guy. And it's just, if you go to this thing looking for practical advice, you're not going to get it because you get these witty mini essays and you come out the other end of them and you don't quite know what to think, but there's this great entry on Welsh rarebit, which is a little food item. I don't actually know what it is. Sometimes spelled Welsh rarebit, sometimes written Welsh rabbit, even though no rabbits are involved. And this is the entry. Welsh rabbit is amusing and right. Welsh rarebit is stupid and wrong. <laughs> and honestly, I think some of this stuff, that's just, some of it, that's what it comes down to. You can't really defend it on any more rational level, but just like, I know what I like and I don't like this. Well, excellent job. We need to give them a round of applause. Um, okay, well first, um, welcome, and let's talk about your new collection. I just want to start about what's new in your life right now. Gillian will be very happy to hear this. It's very much about minimalism. <laughs> um, so M2057 was born from my desire to design again, but I was really interested in um, moving beyond luxury that I had been doing. And the premise of the collection is this really deconstructed, this concept of deconstructed couture. So it's very minimal, um, but it allows the wearer to actually be maximal if she wants. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't. So, and Maria, it, it can actually exist in your world, both of them side by side. <laughs> maximalism I, I and minimalism. So. <laughs> I think it's a mood, and I think there's certain people, and I really respect someone like Gillian, who's very true to this sort of, I've known her for many years. In fact, she was one of my um, professors. And um, yes, she is very you're a true to her here. work. Yeah, I went to the Art Institute. And um, I do think there's a fine line to, how, to bridge that. And I think it's very personal. I think what we wear is very personal. And I kind of even like when people make mistakes. I think it's refreshing. Like, why can't we make a mistake once in a while? I didn't think it was a mistake, but you know, someone else does. 
Well, it sounds like you learn from your mistakes. Like it kind of it's an, it opens a door to more growth for you. Everything's an evolution. Um, I don't consider them mistakes. I think that there's experiences that, you know, take hold and, you know, sometimes you have a certain vision and, uh, th you know, things like the economy or situations interrupt, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's called, I think it's really about evolution. Well, I want to get back to this collection again because this is something that I think is amazing. Everything that you design in this collection is machine washable. Yeah. That is, uh, hello, oh. that's revelatory <laughs> to me. So it, it like it doesn't wrinkle that much. It's a special no, type all. of fabric that you special find. Special fabric, yeah. It's a uh, fabric from Italy. It's machine. As she said it's machine washable. Um, and what's really cool about it, which is which, which gives me the capacity to be very minimal, is it's cuttable. So there's no finishes on the hems or the edges, and it creates a very uh, interesting capacity to be very sculptural. But for the wearer, um, again, part of my interest in this new collection was, you know, really looking at women that I knew and knew what, how, how, um, how crazy our lives are, right? So when you get up in the morning, you go to your closet, you want something, you, want to, you don't want to have to overthink it. Men have right. it easy. I mean, I love men, <laughs> trust me, but in my next life, I'm coming back as, I, I, I love being a woman because I love men, but in my next life, I'm coming back as a man. Because it's so stacked up against women to be so difficult to get up in the morning. How many of you got frustrated in the mornings, right? And so the idea of this brand is to provide really beautiful, and I, I, another term we use around the pieces, like the blank canvas. So they're very easy. They're very go-to. And, you know, if you travel a lot, you know, you come back and throw them in the washing machine. No drag them to the dry cleaner. I love this. This is like a very big selling point for me. Um, what made the transition happen for you in terms of going from luxury to ready to wear? Like why, who, who tires of designing luxurious, you know, <laughs> garments for, you know, famous, fabulous people? <laughs> um, I th don't think I've given up any of those things. Yeah. Actually, what I've done is um, made it more um, available. For everyone. And so what I think is really exciting about what I'm doing, I had so many friends that would say, Maria, I love your clothes, but I just can't afford them. And um, what I love about what I'm doing now is that I could take my same creativity and everything that I've studied, it'll be 25 years that I'm designing this year, that everything that I've, you know, learned, I could put into something that a $300 dress is a little more accessible for most of us, right? Yeah. So... Do you think accessibility should be important for all designers? Do you think? No. No? I don't, you know, I, man, coming off of this whole rule thing with these writers, <laughs> like, whew. Um, I don't think there's any rules. Okay. And I think that, you know... I don't know that I would have been happy doing what I'm doing now if I didn't do luxury. Right. And I think there's other people that that's their space. So, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so let's talk about some, I mean, we have to talk about the first lady. Um, mm -hmm. Became very famous uh, designing for the first lady and she wore your pieces. Yes. Um, what was that process like? And just give us some scoop, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the good news is I, it was kind of like I met Michelle Obama, the next yes. senator's ah, wife. Yes. So there was this evolution of almost a friendship, you could say. Mm -hmm. And um, so when she came in and said, wow, we're, is, we're doing it. And I need to plan for the campaign trail. So, you know, we were like, you know, she was just like this amazing client, but also like just so um, grounded and friendly. And, it, and we kind of grew together as opposed to, you know, all of a sudden you go to the White House and meet the First Lady. So um, uh, they're just lovely, and I think she um, understands clothes in the way that I really think we should all consider them. You know, it's a means to an end, and it should bring joy, not frustration, and it should be, it's, there's a certain utilitarian aspect that I think she appreciates. Mm -hmm. yeah. As a designer, do you see women that you want to dress? Is, there, is it something about them, or do you have muses, or, or does that inspire you at all, or are you more thinking about the everyday woman? Um, I, no, you know, I don't really, um, I want to say uh, this sort of carefully. I really listen and respect what women need, but then I kind of go, go away and let <laughs> me do what I need to do. Because I think in my design process, it's about absorbing a lot of things, right? It's about, about absorbi absorbing the, the obvious that, you know, it's a dress that someone has to be able to wear, but it's also about my creative process. So I, I have to absorb it, and I think there's a way to, well, as my COO accuses me, he said I do everything one to six. So I, you know, I assimilate ideas and, and, and it just has to move pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, so no one in particular. What, what is the process, design process like for you? I mean, do you, because you're also an artist, do you sketch, like, 
do you go mo mostly by color? Are you inspired by traveling? Like what? Um, I, you know, each collection I try to have, a, there's a, fundamentally, there's an M2057 concept mm -hmm. that I have to adhere to, especially with this brand more than my previous brand, because each collection had a little different twist. With this, there's this foundation that ha I have to be true to. And so every season I use a new, um, I, I try to choose something that will really move my process, or in general, just something that moves me. When I heard about, um, I use architecture as a reference a lot. I did a collection for the Architecture Biennial, yeah. inspired by uh, Jeannie Gang and Gang Studio. And um, when I heard that Zaha Hadid died, um, it just really moved me so much. And so, and also I really respect her work. But um, the more I read about her, the person, and, and have seen and been in her structures, she'll be my next inspiration. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's things. That, and, and the only idea, of the most important piece of an inspiration as a creative, you kind of have to have a bracket. And especially in fashion, because like, okay, for spring seven, 17, which is what I'm working on, you know, we're only putting in maybe 12 to 15 new pieces. So you have to get really, you know, laser focused. What is the 2057 part of the, what is the? Um, it's so loaded. That's such a loaded one. Oh, you don't, do you not want to share with us? We so, want to know everything. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, M2057 is really about this marriage between fashion and technology. We launched on Kickstarter. Uh, we, launched, we, we were e-commerce until November, which we opened our first store in the West Loop. And so I wanted a number, because I also didn't want to confuse people. If you're you know, relaunching a brand and it's the same name, uh, it's kind of like, well, she's doing you know, luxury again. So um, in choosing a number, I was having lunch with my mother. This is like three years ago. At that time, she was 97. And I realized, wow, this is kind of cool. I've got her genes, even the one parts of her that I don't like. Um, <laughs> I thought, we all well, do, trust me. Right? We all do. <laughs> so we, uh, the odds are pretty good that maybe if I stop abusing myself, I could live to 100. And so that's the year I turn 100. But by the way, she's turning 100 July 7th. Oh, awesome. So, yeah. You're going to have, you're gonna have to have a big party. Big party. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think there's this misconception, I think, for us. And I, know, I don't understand anything about the complexity of what it takes to launch a, you know, a brand. And mm -hmm. I don't think I use launch properly there. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I just made a fatal grammatical error <laughs> there. Okay. Um, but... I think for us, for the common person, we think that you're, you're dressing Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey, that means automatic success. Like, you have no problems. What are, I mean, but what are some of the obstacles, you know, talk a little bit about that misconception and then sort of what are the obstacles you have as a, as a designer? Sure. Entrepreneur. Um. Yeah, that's the more yeah. keyword, entrepreneur. Yeah. That faces no matter what industry you're <laughs> right. in, right? right? So there's different pieces to this puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, um, it's a huge gift when someone like um, the First Lady, I almost said Michelle, the First Lady or an Oprah or any one of the celebrities, including, this is more, I think you'll like this piece, Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger bought one of my wraps at Ultimo and wore it on stage yes. at Soldier Field. I think that's pretty cool, okay? Yes. So that's my rebel side. Um, but um, I think the, you know, there's obstacles in any business, no matter what industry you're in. And so you, fa you play in that space and have to get through that day to day. And then you're always, you know, challenging yourself with like, because we do all, I do all custom colors. Are these the right colors? I mean, are people going to like it? Are these shapes right? Are, you know, and then there's the technical side, making sure the fit is spot on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not, there, it's, not an, it's not any different than someone who has a restaurant or... No. What about the business aspect? How do you feel? You, do you embrace that or do you really like, yeah, I'm going to focus on the creative? Um, I don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I think I have a little schizophrenia. So as I like to think of myself as hyper creative and that's really why I do what I do. But I think I have enough curiosity to understand and appreciate how to make sure that my business is run properly. And so the key piece to that is surrounding yourself with really smart people. What advice do you give? I feel like every time I'm going to uh, some sort of event I, in the city, I'm seeing these young designers who are all designing these beautiful pieces, but so very few of them, you know, will, will be able to make it mm -hmm. for the, you know, last for the long haul. What kind of advice do you give them? Is it important for them to get into a local store? Or is it important for them to get on 
online? What? I, you know, I if if I could give like seven, you know, points. Oh yes, we, we want seven. It would be so easy, right? Oh. <laughs> it's so complicated and it's so stacked up. I mean, I graduated school in 1991, and um, there were far less schools cranking out, you know, fashion designers every, um, you know, term, and. Um, I think it's really hard, as now more than ever. And I don't think there's any quick answer to that. I mean, you could be selling the best stores, you could be dressing the best, you know, the most profiled people. Um, but it's just a really complicated business. And I would say, more than anything, graduating from school is just the beginning of your education. Mm -hmm. When I finished at the Art Institute, um, I'm a, I guess you could say I'm a little bit of a, I don't know if I would say elitist, snob, but I, um, I had job op offers in New York and I chose to work for Jeffrey Bean as an intern and I waitressed at night because I, my preference was to work with a master, work under a master even as an intern, than to work for another company that sh it didn't have the same meaning to me. So my point is, your education just begins when you get out of school. Right. And unfortunately, Project Runway tells us otherwise. Uh -huh. Like every student that graduates from school thinks they're gonna have their own label the next year. And it's like such a misconception. Yes, and it's actually a super long process. Yeah, that and it should be, and it should be kind of, it's like a craft that you should want to cultivate. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the beauty of going out and working for other people is that you can continue to be in the space of this, you know, wonderful industry, but at the same time, there's just so much to learn. Who do you who do you admire? I mean, uh, who who do you think has you know other designers that you you know think wow this is great this is where I want to be in five ten years or you know or when I'm a hundred this is what I want to have you know um, I want to be on a beach at a hundred <laughs> you're a very smart making lady. art and just chilling out um, you know. It's kind of complicated. First of all, there's not a business, um, there's not a fashion company that I would say I'm okay. trying to emulate because there's a lot of new opportunities with e-commerce. And what we're doing right now, um, I kind of borrowed, you know, the company Bonobos. Um, they do men's clothing. They and make those great shorts for guys. Yeah. <laughs> and so his, but his genius was, instead of being, he, he thought it would be a pure e-commerce play. And as it turns out, he realized he needed storefronts. But he done, did it in a very streamlined way. And so that's what we're doing. So when you come to our shop, you, you, you try things on and you order it online and it's shipped to you so we don't have to keep inventory. Ah. So I guess there isn't a, a particular business model that we're trying to follow. Um, but as designers that I respect, there's many, obviously. Yeah. Um, you said your shop is more like a studio. You want people to think of it as a studio. Well, I, I'd like to think of everything in the, with M2057 as being really art-centric. The background of that is one of my paintings, actually. Um, so studio versus you know, a store, because you're not, like, what we're used to in terms of the store experience is that you'd come in and walk out with a shopping bag, and that's not what's going to happen. Yeah. So we wanted to twi switch it up a little. How, so let's, I, just generally, let's talk about style in your life. I mean, as a, as a designer, you're designing these, just these beautiful, effortless clothes, but what, how does, uh, tell us a little bit about your style. What does Maria like? <laughs> like, I mean, we want to know. My shoes. What, I mean, um, what are you wearing on a Saturday, or, like, when you're not, talking to people and, you know, um, I, like what are some of your favorite things? That are um, you know, I kind of dress the same no matter what, like, you know, it depends. You're like Gillian, me. all black all the time. No, actually, sorry Gillian, I love color, but I don't, I don't, I guess right now, especially because I'm so hyper busy, <laughs> that my color space is so focused on my work that like occasionally I'll pull out something color and I, ha I do wear it and love it, but there's a uniform aspect to black that mm -hmm. I really like, so. Uh. And it, it, does style kind of permeate every part of your life? I mean, is your, what, is your home a certain, I mean, yeah. everything that you, yeah. down I, to even maybe like a food you, I, I'm curious, I just wanna know how you live your life <laughs> with um, style in mind. <laughs> you know, I, I, first of all, I, like, I think the word style is, I know that that's what this day is called, but I think the word style can be an interesting word, but also an overused word, and a word that can be somewhat, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, intimidating. Um, uh, to me, it's about just appreciation of beauty, and whatever that is, for some, you know, what you consider beautiful, I might consider ugly. Um, so yeah, I'm, I have attention to, I have a high regard for things being 
beautifully displayed and you know I've read enough about the art of placement and you know I'll walk through the store and it's perfectly fine and I'll be moving bags and they're like oh here she comes you know <laughs> and so I like that yeah I like even in our back offices when you open a file cabinet drawer you know that it contains office supplies I want it to be orderly and and kind of aesthetically pleasing, you know? Yeah. I think it's, you know, it, I think there's a sense, when it, when things feel that way, there's a sense of order that f creates a sense of calmness. I guess that's why I like, I gravitate to that. And, and then do you think style is achievable for for everyone? For every, everyone, no matter what walk of life, yeah. what kind of budget they're working with? Absolutely, because I think some of the greatest style is street style. Yeah. I think kids on the street, I love, love watching, like, you know, going into, like, I love going to Logan Square, or I love going to, you know, outside of, you know, or, you you know, you get into pockets of neighborhoods, right, and there's certain kinds of style in a certain neighborhoods, because we kind of have that sensibility, right, you go to, let's, let's get out of Chicago, you go to New York, you go to Uptown, Upper East Side, it's a certain sort of vibe, right, um, but I think you, style is inherent, I mean, and some of the greatest inspiration comes from kids that have no money, and, you know, I was showing uh, my assistant the yesterday, I found a bracelet that I made. Actually, it's from Gillian's class. It was, uh, <laughs> she had us making these um, jewelry, and she said you could use whatever materials you wanted. So I went to the plumbing, uh, to the hardware store, and I bought these strips of copper plumbing tubing, whatever they were, and I cut them up, and she gave me this chemical that created a patina. And then I wove them through, I cut them a certain length, and I wove them with suede and made a cool bracelet. And it probably cost, you know, pennies. Mm -hmm. So... It's incredible. Are, are you, um, how do you feel about, uh, they were showing pictures of uh, Empire, you had a couple of outfits. Is that like, how, are you super excited when you see your clothes? Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. I mean, even, you know, whether it's on TV or I'm at a fun, uh, an event or, um, oh, where is she? Someone's here today wearing one of my archives. And I'm um, sorry, I'm brain dead right now. Where are you? Would you like there to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> um, I get so excited. And like for seeing my, for something from my archive was like kind of seeing your baby that you haven't seen in 20 years that moved away, you know, went away to school and came back home for after 20 years. I was going to ask you what what it feels like when you see someone just on the street wearing totally. your clothes it's that so you don't exciting. know. Yeah, it's so cool. Like I... You know, I'll go to a fundraiser or lunch, and I see women wearing my M2057 pieces. I mean, I get so thrilled and so grateful. More importantly, I'm just very grateful that people want and, have, you know, are wearing them. Well, you talked a lot about um, how style and fashion, it's, it's about evolution for you. Mm -hmm. And you did a lot of the wraps before, um, right. you did slip dresses before. Is it ever hard for you to let go? And we're talking about pieces that are from your, you know, archives. Is it hard for you to let go of some of them? Or are you just ready to move on? You don't hold on to that? Or you um, want to do something totally different the next yeah, go Yeah, because I've done it. Yeah. This is the part of creative processes that you're curious to want to do something new. Um, that me doesn't mean that I haven't saved my archives. And I'm very excited when I, you know, when I look back and see what I've done and, you know, but I, uh, it's kind of exciting to keep moving. Even, uh, you know, you can't be in fashion and not be excited about change because yeah. that's what has to happen every season. Wow, fabulous. Okay, I'm gonna open this up for some questions. Oh, see one back there. Hi, um, I wondered, um, growing up, um, did you have any sort of fashion icons? I know that, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, you know, the Mary Tyler Moore show and oh, that yeah. girl was so mod and those kinds of things. So I was wondering if there was anything from popular culture that spoke to you as a girl growing up in America. Um, you hit on two of my favorites. I love that girl. Um, but I, um, I was also really, as far as designers go, it was Halston. And um, my, I, um, I, I, I made a... Uh, a dress from a Halston pattern for my prom. And I was definitely an outlier because that, I mean, there was still, most of my girlfriends were wearing something more prom-like. And um, so, yeah, that was, that, that girl was great. And I, I buy Halston now. It's so awesome. The dress yeah. is so great. Michelle. Okay, another question. Right up here. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation, it was great. Uh, I'm an interior designer and oftentimes I will um, be working with a client who's aesthetic. I, I like to design for my client. I don't feel like I have to always make my mark. 
but um, when I'm designing for a client that oftentimes I don't think their aesthetic is right for the project or, or their f what their requirements are right for oh. the space, how do you deal with clients that you don't agree with or you see going a different direction? Is How the, do you is the client that? always <laughs> right? Is the client always right? You know, it, that's such a slippery slope because, um, like, I talk to my st uh, stylist, my sales team, about it all the time. And I think it's really important to, to be honest, even if it's, and it's so, like, how do you say it is so important, the diplomacy of how, how do you give alternatives? Because the most important thing is you don't want her to go away. If you compromise and, and what you really believe is wrong sh and, you, and, and she wears this, what's going to happen? Her husband, her friends are going to tell her, what is that? <laughs> and then she'll never come back to you again. So that's how I, I, I put it in my head that I have to be. like. But the diplomacy of how you deliver that message is hard, the real hard part. I hope that helped you. Can't wait to hear how this conversation goes with your client. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, we're at uh, 833 West Washington, right at the cross corner of Washington and Green by Soho House. So come by and visit us. Thank you, Marie, so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. You're fabulous. Thank you. And thanks, everybody.